And go ahead. There we go. Okay, so our, our presenters are Bill and Judy Adams. They've presented for the chapter several times. Um, they, they are veteran birders. Let me say it this way. Okay, Judy has taught, for, taught school for 33 years. Uh, everything from kindergarten, mostly uh, elementary, but also some high school. Bill taught for 38 years, third, third grade through high school uh, over that, that uh, career. Um, both of them have been birding longer than they were teaching. Uh, uh, and so that's, it's been a pretty much a lifelong uh, passion there for, for Judy and, and, and plenty long enough for Bill too. Um, and in addition to uh, teaching, they have traveled widely, uh, seeing birds, taking pictures of birds uh, in both hemispheres. And tonight they are going to uh, treat us to their trip from about a year and a half ago, pre-COVID. Uh, they weren't able to take the trip for this year's trip down the Amazon, but, uh, but they did get the uh, summer of 19, if I have that right. Uh, they took the, the trip to Southern Africa. And so without further ado, um, thank you, uh, Judy and Bill, and, and I'll turn it over to you. Hi, good evening, and welcome to the birds and the wildlife of Southern Africa. Um, last summer, Bill and I took a trip to South Africa, Zimbabwe, and Zambia. We left Reading on August 15, 2019, and we returned on September 10. Now, we went that time of year because we knew that it was the end of winter in the Southern Hemisphere, and therefore the dry season. Now, this has the disadvantage of missing the summer migrants, but the distinct advantage of very much less foliage on the trees and very little tall grasses. So the spotting of the birds and the wildlife is much easier. What we didn't know when we planned the trip a whole year in advance was that it was going to be a year of severe drought in South Africa. Now, our original plan was to just do a self drive of the Kruger National Park. And um, we got to thinking about the 30 plus hours it was gonna take for us to travel there and to come back again, 30 hours back. And so we decided maybe we would add on a little trip up to see the magnificent Victoria Falls. So after two 11 hour flights and an eight hour layover in Madrid, Spain, where we toured the city, we decided we were going to be totally exhausted and it would probably be a good idea for us to stay at a lodge for one day outside of Johannesburg and rest up, which turned out to be a very good idea. So the birder in us, and you can see Bill walking out right there, the birder in us could not help but notice as we looked over the manicured lawns there of Ninkanga Lodge that there were three ponds just beyond the manicured lawns of the lodge. And so after a three hour nap and the showers that we needed desperately, we went out to start seeing what birds we could add to our Africa list. The first and of many species we saw right there on the ground was this African hoopoe with its long probing bill that was searching for insects beneath the grass. Now the hoopoe gets its name from the call that it makes. It says, whoop, 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 whoop. Here is a reed warbler, right in the reeds where it belongs, and a black-headed heron, which turned out to be the most common heron that we saw on our 18-day safari. Um, it is just about the same size as a great blue heron. This is called a blacksmith lapwing kind of a long-legged plover. And it also gets its name from the sound that it makes. It sounds like a blacksmith's hammer hitting metal. Tink, tink, tink. This is South Africa's common yard sparrow called a cape sparrow. And these cute, tiny warbler-like white eyes were often found in the backyards and the gardens gleaning insects. Now, Africa has many shrike species, and you can ID them all by that hook on the end of their bill. 
This one we saw first in the beautiful sunset light of the first night we were there. And then again the next morning before we caught our flight to Zimbabwe. It's called a common fiscal. We had our first sighting of a gray go away bird there on the grounds of Ninkanga. They used to be called a gray luri. They are fruit eaters and they get their names from the alarm call that they make. Because when they see a predator, they tell them to go away. We had hoped to see a Goliath heron while we were in South Africa, and we were excited when we found one right there on the grounds of the lodge. Now they're called a Goliath heron because they are 59 inches tall. A great blue heron is only 46. So you can imagine we were thrilled to see it. Now this is Africa's alarm clock. They're called a hottie daw ibis, and they have a loud rackish flight call, and they start moving around really early in the morning. Ah! 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 This is a Karoo thrush, and it is the kind of the yard robin of South Africa, as you find them commonly in the yards and gardens. There are lots of different pigeons and doves that you can find in South Africa. And we found, found four species right on the grounds of Ninkanga. This, the most common one, is the Cape turtle dove. And every safari you go on, you will hear it telling you to work harder, work harder. <laughs> the emerald spotted wood dove was probably one of the prettiest, at least I thought so. This is a red-eyed dove, and these are laughing doves, but their call was more like purring than it was laughter. This Namaqua dove with its beautiful black face and long tail was not found on the grounds of Nkanga. Instead, we found it in the arid areas in central Kruger. This is Africa's coot a red knobbed coot, as you can see there by its nose. And this is a male and female reed cormorant that were there preening in the morning light. I never got both of them in the same picture looking good. We also found these tort by lots of small streams and I was surprised at how little water they required. We found three species of weavers on the ground there at Nkanga, they hang their woven nests above the water sources to protect their chicks from predators. This particular one was called a southern mask weaver and it's the male. This one is a thick billed weaver male. And this particular one is called a village weaver, also the male. The center picture is on the grounds of Nkanga. And then down below, you will notice that this is the southern weaver male comparing the um, village weaver male. And you'll notice basically the only difference is that the back of the village weaver is much darker in its pattern. Now, this is a picture of the nests that they build. Usually there's like 10 to 25 of them hanging in one tree over the water. And now here's the interesting fact about these nests. The male builds the nest. And when he's done, he attracts a female to come and check it out. So she looks it over all inside and out. And if she doesn't like it, she rips it apart and he has to start all over again. These are white faced whistling ducks with their long legs like most whistling ducks have. And some yellow bill ducks. And these were just a few of the species that we found on the grounds of our restover. Here is our first African sunset. And we had quickly discovered when we were in Tanzania in 2015 that every sunrise and every sunset in Africa is spectacular. You don't need any clouds. It has something to do with the dust in the air. But whatever the reason, they are spectacular. Then we flew up to Zimbabwe, and this is not our picture, but I wanted to show you this so you could see the absolutely amazing length of this, the Victoria um, Falls. 
and I am going to eventually show you pictures from three of the different viewpoints. There were actually 15 of them along the face of the falls. First, the southernmost part, and this side is the Zimbabwe side. Then the middle of the Zimbabwe side where the most spray is seen. And then here, where is the dividing line between Zimbabwe and Zambia. And you can look both ways and see both sides of the falls. Here we are on the southernmost part of the Zimbabwe inside. And here we are at that area with the spray. And we had found out that if you get there in the morning, you would be able to have the sun behind you and therefore you would get pictures of the beautiful, beautiful rainbows. Here we're standing at the dividing line, looking back towards the Zimbabwe inside. And if you remember, I mentioned that there was a drought that year. Well, the Zambia side was almost completely devoid of water. As we walked along the pathway there, along the front of the falls, we began to see a few species of birds, including this iconic um, African fish eagle. These are some starlings. They're called red wing starlings, and this is the black male at the top and the gray female at the bottom. And it is just one of many absolutely gorgeous starlings that are in Africa. And I'll show you more of them later. We were really excited when we realized that this flyover was of a trumpet or hornbill. And we knew that because we noticed the white uh, secondary feathers and the white belly. On the number five uh, viewpoint, we saw this cute little white-browed robin chat. Chat meaning it has some characteristics of a flycatcher. Anyway, we watched it. It was so cute bouncing around all over there until some other non-birders came by and, well, they didn't even notice there was a bird there and it was gone. Evening comes, as it always does, when you want the day to last longer, and we decided to watch the sunset over the Zambezi River. Here is the spray you can see from the falls up here and over here, and the setting sun. Now, I don't wonder if anybody notices anything weird about this African lodge, the decorations. Larry, you happen to see anything funny about this lodge? Yeah, that looks like a Quetzal bird. It is. This is a resplendent Quetzal, and they are only found from Mexico City to Panama. So what a picture of doing in an African lodge. I have no idea. <laughs> That's bizarre. <laughs> We decided we did not want to drive while we were in Zimbabwe. Oh, sorry. I, uh, you need to unmute yourself. I accidentally, sorry. Thanks, Larry. <laughs> we had decided we weren't going to drive when we were in Zimbabwe because we were only going to be there for two days. So we hired guides for a little bit of each of the two days. And this particular guide was Daniel. And he was absolutely amazing. This is a baobab tree, and Zimbabwe had some beautiful, beautiful ones. If you look down below, you will notice that there's a fence around this baobab tree because the elephants tend to ring bark them. They're looking for the cambium layer that is underneath the bark, which is the layer that carries the nutrients from the roots up to the leaves. Many, many baobab trees never make it to adulthood because of the elephants. This is an African darter which is very much like our American Anhinga. These thrush-like chagras are two extremely similar species. And unless you get a good look at the top of the head, it's very hard to tell them apart. This one is the black crown chagra. And this one, if you can look up here, you'll see that it is the brown crown chagra. And like most, thrushes, the chagra has a lovely so song. And yes, that clicking was part of its song. Now there were two black flycatchers that we saw very frequently while we were there. This particular one is just a 
black flycatcher. And you can tell it apart from the fork-tailed drongo because of the small fork in the tail. Whereas the fork-tailed drongo has a rather large set of forks in its tail. And they like to follow the antelope and the buffalo and the elephants around because they kick up insects. And then these little flycatchers will go down and pick up the insects. Now this is Bill's absolute favorite bird family of the world. It is a barbet with its chunky little body and its thick bill. And like most of the barbets, this black collared barbet is absolutely beautiful. This is a black wing stilt, minus that black neck of ours. These lovely little blue wax bills were often found eating seeds along the ground. And if any of you have been to Hawaii, you will notice that this bird looks very much like their cordon bleu. This is a rattling cysticula. There are 19 cysticula species in Africa. They are divided into the long-tailed, the short-tailed, the plain-backed, and the streak-backed. But they are so much alike within their different divisions that you often have to hear their call to know which one you're looking at. And besides, these guys have the weirdest names like rattling, croaking, zitting, lazy. This is a collared palm thrush. And its name, like it infers, tells you that you only find these birds near the palm trees along the lower Zamb Zambezi River and parts of Mozambique, and therefore they're very hard to find. The town of Victoria Falls, where we stayed, is known for its elephants that come very close to the city. Now, we were only a few kilometers out some dirt roads when we saw this big bull, Ellie, munching his way through the leaves of a tree. He was a big boy, but not as big as some of the ones we saw. About a half a kilometer down the dirt road, we saw this little herd of Ellie's. Now, this was the matriarch, we think, because she was the biggest. And here, if you look closely, you will see a tiny little one-month-old baby lying at her feet, taking a little nap. Now, we were there watching her, and she, they were all totally, totally relaxed, and everything was fine. And then all of a sudden, she started to get very agitated, and she began to rumble. And then she began to trumpet. And sure enough, along came that male that we had seen earlier, and he began pushing his way into the group. And the mommy took her foot and woke up this baby, and then she stood over it to protect it with her body. And the poor little baby was so upset about being woken by a kick that it decided it had to suckle for a little while. So sweet. But the male left and the little guy came out to play as most little ones will. It is so much fun to watch giraffes drink. They have to spread their legs wide and get those long necks way down. And then, because the blood pools in their heads while they're drinking, they have to give their head a little shake as soon as they're done, and it sprays water all over everything. This is a lilac-breasted roller. It is a nas national bird of South Africa and several other of the countries in Africa. And as you can see, it has eight absolutely stunning colors. There's green, white, lilac, brown, blue, turquoise, and black. And you can really find these very large flycatchers because when they dart off their perch to catch an insect, those turquoise patches on their wings just glow in the light. Now Africa has its big five, it has its little five, and it has its ugly five. And this marabou stork is right up there on the list of the ugly five. This happened to be at a rookery or nesting area. And if you look closely, you can see the fuzzy little white chicks down here in their nests. These quail-like birds are called Natal spur fowls. And if you look here on their feet, you will see where they get the name of a spur fowl. Well, not your prettiest stork. 
The open bill stork is not quite as ugly as the marabou, but take a look at that bill. How it keeps its fish in, I have no idea. Here is a pied wagtail dipping and wagging its tail as it forages along the edge of the Zambezi River. Now our guide Daniel had been given a call while he was on his lunch break to tell that he had somebody had seen this rare pink-backed pelican at the uh, near the Marabou Stork Rookery. And so after lunch, we drove out and we were very lucky to be able to get a sighting of a pink-backed pelican. One of our greatest bird parties, or here in America, we'd call them mixed feeding flocks, um, included this dark-capped bulbul, this yellow-bellied green bull, this tropical boo-boo, and this red-eyed bulbul. Four live birds, and we didn't even have to move the vehicle. And then, just a short way down the road, Daniel, our guide, spotted this yellow chested apollos. Now this is my picture and it didn't turn out very well so I cheated and took one off the internet and you can see here how beautiful those little guys are. We finished our day with Daniel with this sacred ibis that was looking quite dirty after it was foraging. The next day we had hired Charles Brightman to give us a tour in the morning of the Zimbabwe National Park and then to arrange a cruise on the Zambezi River that evening. Not only was he an excellent guide, but he is the head of the anti-poaching unit in the Zimbabwe National Park. He spotted so many species that we would never have been able to ID because most of what we saw in the Zimbabwe National Park were far, far away. Like this black-chested snake eagle and these chestnut-backed sparrow larks. And this green wing petilia, which is absolutely beautiful, but very hard to spot in the grasses. He quickly ID'd this as a lizard buzzard. And sure enough, when we got back to the hotel and zoomed in on our pictures, you could see its little black beard that makes it differentiated from this little sparrow hawk because they both have gray heads and striped chests. And this picture of the sparrowhawk we later got in Zambia. Now, this is a pearl spotted owlet. They're a diurnal owlet and they are very small, about six inches tall, but it has a wonderful call that lets you know that it's around. We were very excited when we got to see a good sighting of a secretary bird with its long legs walking through the tall grasses looking for snakes. Now, like all good secretaries, it had its pens behind its ears and a few extra ones hidden in its hair. In case you hadn't noticed, the Zimbabwe National Park has true savanna grasslands which is a good place to spot things like this Swainson spurfowl and this wattled lapwing, which is a, not a wetland species, but instead a grassland species. Now this is its cousin, which is called a white crowned lapwing, and it is a wetland species. And we got this picture beside the Zambezi River. Finally, a savanna bird that made a close up appearance. This is a white-browed sparrow weaver, meaning it has characteristics of a sparrow, but it also weaves nests, but his nests are not placed over the water since he is a grassland species. Uh, anybody notice this poor zebra's tail here? It's missing. Now, zebras are downright mean. They kick, they bite, they're horrible. They're absolutely terrible to each other. And the males will fight because they gather together a harem of females. And that male probably lost his tail while he was gathering this harem together. Well, Charles Brightman had set up a really fantastic river cruise for us. 
it was on this very small boat and you can tell, you can just see the back. This is the whole half, back half of the boat. It was only big enough for the captain, his helper and two groups. And lucky for us, guess what? The second group canceled and didn't come. So we were there by ourselves on that cruise. Now here's the bigger boats heading off, but we didn't follow them because we told the captain what some target birds are we were hoping to see were. And so he just took us around looking for our target birds. It was a fantastic trip. Now near the top of our target bird list was a black heron. And we had hoped to see it fishing, but we were not lucky enough to do that. But in this picture I took from the internet, you can see that when a black heron fishes, it makes an umbrella of its wings, and then the, it breaks the glare of the sun off the water, and it can see the fish down below that are swimming around. Pretty clever, I would say. Also on the top of our list was a, a duckish type bird that um, is called a fin foot. And we started looking for fin foot around this island. But the guide said, you know, uh, don't be too disappointed if we don't get to see one because they are really very rare. But we did notice that there happened to be these elephants who had actually swam through the Zambezi River to get out here and browse on this island. But then guess what? We found a fin foot. In fact, we found two fin foots. This one was swimming in the water at the edge of the island, and this one had climbed out, probably looking for a roost for the night. Tick, tick, two of our top targets. Everything else would just be a bonus, like this Goliath heron, this spur-winged goose, and yes, it has a spur right on its elbow, but you only see it when they fly some white fronted bee eaters that make their homes in the cliffs of the river. And then the sun set on our last day in Zimbabwe. The next morning before dawn, we took a taxi to the Zimbabwean border and we walked in the dark pulling our suitcases across that bridge over the Zambezi River and to the customs on the Zambia side. Boy, were we happy to see our guide for the next three hours waiting there in the dark for us. We started our tour on the grounds of some lodges right along the Zambezi River. And we were quite surprised to see these zebra uh, having their breakfast on the manicured lawns. The first bird we spotted in the early morning light was this precious little bearded robin chat just waking up so we missed its beautiful song. Next, and still snoozing, was this purple heron with many of the same colors as a Goliath heron, but only half the size. We had to walk around the pond to see the front. And since he was still pretty sleepy, he didn't even fly away. But the sun did rise and we spotted this purple roller on the river's edge. And this yellow fronted tinkerbird, which is closely related to the barbets, was, but much smaller, was calling away his greeting to the morning light. This is a Bennett's woodpecker. And the Bennett's woodpecker um, normally spends most of its time foraging along the bottom of trees or on the ground themselves, unlike most of its cousins. Here is a pair of brown hooded kingfishers. You can see that the male has black feathers on his back and the female has brown feathers on her back. And these are insectivores, not fishers. Now here is the reason why we hired a guide for three hours before we had to be at the airport. This is a Shalos Turaco. Turacos are large birds with crested heads and long tails and absolutely stunning red primaries. We found this guy by listening to its loud barking call. Wow, so beautiful, uh, the bird, not the call. 
Woohoo, a double bonus. Very near the Taraco tree, we found this trumpeter hornbill sitting in a tree and calling every few minutes. Now, I have to admit that his call sounds more like a kid's party toy rather than a trumpet. That's for you, Larry. <laughs> we got quite close to him. No flyby this time. After our Taraco success, we were picked up by a driver and taken a few kilometers out of the city to these ponds where he dropped us off with a promise that he would meet us at the sewer ponds about five kilometers away. And then he would take us to the airport. Well, right here with the, at the ponds where he left us, we saw this intermediate egret, which is of course larger than a little egret. And it also has green legs down to about the knees and then it has black at the bottom as compared to the little egret that has black above and yellow at the bottom. We also saw this squawko heron feeding among the water hyacinths of the pond. Now our walk to the sewer ponds was through what they call the block or the woodlands between dirt roads. So as we left the ponds and we were walking along quietly looking for birds, all of a sudden the guide said, stop. Ahead of us were four elephants and we were on foot with only our binoculars and the guide's scope. Now, if you take an official walking safari in Africa with a guide, you are also accompanied by a ranger with a rifle. No ranger here. After watching their behavior for a little while, the guide said, you know, they seem pretty relaxed. Would you like to try to walk around them or would you like to go back? go back? Are you kidding me? No. So we slowly skirted around them, never getting any closer, and they watched us the whole time, but they never left their trees. And here you can see there's one elephant here, a second one here with his trunk, the third elephant, and then the fourth one over here. And look at that eye. He was watching us very carefully. These little golden-breasted buntings are listed as common birds, but their backs are so camouflaged that we saw a whole bunch of things that look like LBJs, and they may have been golden-breasted buntings if they had just turned around and we could look at them. And talk about a plain bird, this pallid flycatcher looked exactly like the branches it was on. Like most flycatchers, it couldn't hold still very long though, so pretty soon it gave away its position. And then we went to the sewer ponds. And like all sewer ponds, there were many, many bird species around. But we were looking for this wood sandpiper and this long-toed lapwing. Oh, he was so gorgeous. We are just a little disappointed though that we never got to see his long toes because they were always hidden in the water hyacinth. And then the driver came and took us to the airport in Livingston, Zambia. We flew back to Johannesburg and rented a car and started out for the Kruger National Park. Poor Bill, oh my goodness, he gave me many laughs, laughs that first day. Now they drive on the left side of the road in Africa. So that means that the windshield wiper lever is exactly where American cars have their blinkers. Uh-huh, you guessed it. He turned on the windshield wipers every time he changed lanes that first day. We stopped in Malalon, this little town you can see here at the bottom of the map, and went to a grocery store because we planned to eat mostly our own food and um, only buy a lunch here and there to conserve money. Now, Bill had read that if you line your uh, ice chest with a mylar lining, that the ice would last longer. So here's our little collapsible freezer with its mylar lining. We would freeze two 28 ounce water bottles overnight in the bungalow freezers, and then 12 hours of safari later, they would be less than half thawed out. 
Kruger National Park is two plus times larger than Yellowstone National Park. It is 7,523 square miles. So we didn't get a chance to visit all of it in our 15 days, but we did spend the night at nine different rest camps. Now Kruger has very strict safety rules and rightfully so, um, which is why we felt safe during doing a self-drive. You may never, never leave your car except at the fenced camps and picnic areas. The gates to the camps are locked from 6 p.m. at night until 6 a.m. the following morning, and there are huge fines if you don't make it in the gate by closing time. So you have 12 hours to hunt birds and wildlife, and then 12 hours for battery charging, baths, dinner, sleep. We entered down here at the Malalon Gate, and we spent the nights at Bergendahl, Pretorius Cop, Skakuza, Lower Sabi, Crocodile Bridge, Satara, Oliphants, and Lataba. And we went to this section because there were different species of birds than we would find down below. And then we decided we wanted to stay at a tented camp and it was not actually Orpen, that is the gate that's right there. It was called Tambuti Tented Camp and I'll tell you why we decided to stay there later. This is one of the bungalows that we stayed in. Now, South Africans eat their dinner outside every evening and they cook it over a braai or barbecue. So every bungalow had a um, table on its porch and it also had a refrigerator on its porch and many times also your stove was out on the porch and the braai, of course. But while uh, Africa does not have bears, it has baboons. And so every refrigerator had to be all locked up with special latches on them that baboons couldn't get into. And all your garbage had to be put into baboon bins. Now, baboons are mighty cute, you know, as long as they're not ripping everything apart. And if they happen to get inside your room, well, let's just say it's not very nice smelling when they leave. Oh, and now the starlings, the absolutely beautiful, gorgeous starlings. This one is called a blue-eared starling. And it's blue ear right here. If it was in the sunlight just right, it glowed so beautiful. This one is a Birchall starling. It lacks the yellow eye and has a longer tail. This is the Cape Glossy starling and its iridescence was green rather than blue. Here is a violet backed starling. They were rather uncommon and we were lucky enough to see two of them on our trip. Here is a Meves, which is a very large starling. And when you see its iridescence, it is purple. But even though the Meves is large, it wasn't quite as large as those red winged ones we saw back in Zimbabwe. Here is a big male kudu with its spiral horns. It is about the size of a female elk and it weighs about 550 pounds. On the backs of the antelope were these red-billed oxpeckers. They ride along searching through the fur for ticks and other vermin. And basically they live off of blood. And if the host happens to have an open wound, well, they will just drink fresh blood straight from the wound and they will even pick at the wound to keep it open so that their dinner buffet is still open. Ooh. This is a female water buck and you can recognize her by her little white ring on her bum, which looks a bit like she sat down on a wet, just painted toilet seat. The males have huge horns and I will repeat that, horns. None of the antelope have antlers. They have horns that grow from about the time they're three months old and they continue to grow all their lives. Our first Kruger sunset which means get inside your gate at your rest camp within the next 15 minutes or you'll be paying a fine. This little insectivore is a brew brew and he had this lovely rusty stripe down the side of him. And I, that was a brew brew as compared to the boo boo that we saw in Zimbabwe. 
These guys are also insectivores and they're called black-backed puffbacks because when they get excited, they puff up a, their feathers on the base of their tail and it looks like a little white pom-pom. Very cute. Now this is a Cape Buffalo and they are nothing like water buffaloes. They cannot be domesticated and they are extremely dangerous. And this one is a male and you could tell that by its boss or the part between the horns. The males have much thicker bosses and they join together in the middle. A female would have a thinner boss and often have hair here between the middle part of the horns. Here is a crowned lapwing. And again, this is not a wetlands bird, but it one that prefers the grasslands or in this case, even the roadways. Now, my sister was extremely worried when she heard we were going to do a self-driving tour of Kruger. But if you follow the safety rules and you use common sense, you'll be just fine. First of all, you never drive up on an elephant. They have flipped cars over and smashed them in fits of anger. They don't like to be startled and they don't like to feel threatened. You always let them come to you. And then you watch for warning signs of irritation, like a tail stiffly held out behind and not wagging, or ears flared forward and not flapping, or eyes held wide open. If you see any of those signals, you just have to move away. But we followed the rules and these three came right up to the side of our car. And then unbelievably, this one right here, he lifted his trunk and smelled me, oh my goodness, for 20 wonderful seconds. We watched them and then they walked across the road in front of us. It was like totally amazing. Here are three male giraffe and you can tell they're males by their thick Aussie cones that are bald on the top. And the reason they're bald on the top is because they fight by necking, which means they swing their heads and necks and whack the other males with them, and which of course makes their Aussie cones bald. And they have been known to hit each other so hard that they can knock each other unconscious. This is a female impala, and impalas are the most abundant antelope in the Kruger National Park and in Southern Africa. And this is the male with its lovely spiral horns. Now, and the um, impala happen to be the leopard's favorite food. And you will often find impala up in tree branches having been hoisted there by a leopard. Oh yes, and there are lilac breasted rollers in the Kruger National Park too. And like I said, you often find impala up in a tree. This was one that we spotted and on our first pass through, we did not see the leopard that had put it there. But two hours later, when we drove back by in a different tree, we spotted him. And you can see that those rosettes that they have are really fabulous camouflage. This is a black headed Oriole. And he or she and the mate were in a flowering tree calling back and forth. These little finches have a very descriptive name that you will not soon forget. They are called cutthroat finches. See it? We only saw these finches on this very exact spot, though we did see them on two different days of our trip. Now this was a wonderful and yet sad elephant sighting. This matriarch had broken her front right foot and she was limping slowly along with her tiniest calf that looked to be about eight to 10 months old and then the next two calves up that of course were sticking with their mother as she brought them here to this watering hole. Now the older calves went in for a swim and get a drink while that little baby ran around chasing birds, splashing in and out of the water and basically acting like a little hooligan until mom gave a low rumble and off they followed her. 
There are very few tuskers left in the wild anymore. Most of them have been poached for their ivory. Now this old lady, and I say old because you'll see here her sunken temples in the top of her head, which shows how old she is. Um, she has was probably not going to be around much longer. So that ivory is probably about as long as it was going to get. This is a hurricane thrush, and uh, it was taking advantage of a half bottle of water somebody had left on their braai. The lappet face vulture is the largest and strongest vulture in Africa. Sometimes the other vultures have to wait for a lappet wing or a, a lappet face to arrive, so it can use that strong beak to open up a carcass so that the others can get into the meat. This is a much smaller and very thin-billed vulture called a hooded vulture. And they're the last ones on a carcass because they use that tiny little bill there to strip the last bit of meat from the bones. This is my second favorite antelope in South Africa. They're called nyalas. And the female is this lovely rusty brown with white stripes and spots. And you can see the male there behind her. Now the male has these gorgeous orange knee socks and a fluffy, fluffy beard. And if you look along his back, he has a white mane that runs along his back. Now, one of the reasons I like these so much is their way of deciding dominance. When a male meets another male, it fluffs up all of this beard, it puts up all of this um, little mane on the back of its neck, and it slowly starts to strut itself until one of the males decide they're just a little less handsome and walks away. No fighting for these dudes, it's all in the dance. Now bush shrikes are shrikes that prefer the thick understory to the tall trees, skulkers. And we were only able to get quick glimpses of this gray-headed bush shrike at the Matambini um, hide. Believe it or not, this orange-breasted bush shrike is not the most beautiful shrike in Kruger National Park. The gorgeous bush shrike, and yes, that's its name, has a beautiful red throat where this one has the yellow. Aha, and here is the second Taraco we had hoped to see when we were in Southern Africa. Once again, we found this purple crested Taraco by following the sound of its large bark. Taracos are large birds, about 16 and a half to 17 inches long, and they're about the size of a chakalaka. We were quite surprised when we had actually about five sightings of the purple crested taraco, always in very big trees. Boy, did I love those red primaries. Now, in the heat of the day, the animals don't move around much. They kind of just hang in the shade of the trees. And birders like us go to a water uh, bird hide and watch the birds during the middle of the day until three o'clock or so when it starts to cool off again. Here is a warthog wallowing in the mud. And this female giraffe getting a drink at the Natan Yondothi hide. South Africa has many eagles. Of course, this iconic African fish eagle, and there were seven other species of eagles that we saw while we were in the Kruger National Park. This one is a medium-sized eagle called a long-crested eagle. This is a large eagle called a tawny eagle, and it is a scavenger, and when you see one, you kind of start thinking there's probably a carcass nearby. This medium-sized Wahlberg's eagle comes in three different morphs, and colors and it is often with colors that are in between the different morphs so it is easily more easily told of what bird this is by looking at the back of its head because it had a little tiny crest on the back of its head 
which looked a little bit more like a bad hair day than a crest. And talk about a bad hair day. This is a juvenile batelur eagle. And we kept wondering why we saw many, many juvenile batelurs until we read that it actually takes them seven years to develop their adult plumage. They used to be called a short-tailed eagle, and if you look up here, you can see why they would be called a short-tailed eagle, because you can't even see its tail up there below the branch. Uh, this black-chested snake eagle um, was very similar to the huge and powerful martial eagle, but you could tell the difference because it had a yellow eye and a much tinier bill, as you can look up here and see the huge bill on the um, martial eagle. Plus the snake eagles have bare legs. Their feathers don't go down their legs. Here is the brown chested snake eagle, also with no feathers on its legs and yellow eyes. This female bush buck was having her afternoon siesta in the shade of the women's bathroom and didn't seem bothered at all with the people coming and going, while the male hung out by the picnic tables. Cuckoos are very large cuckoo-like birds. Uh, they like to hang around in the tall grasses and in the bushes out in the savanna grasslands. They like to feed on rodents and frogs and um, this one is called a Birchall's Kukul, and this one is a Senegal Kukul. And they're also known as the rainbirds because you often can hear their haunting calls just before the rain. This male cheetah was marking his territory by spraying urine on the tree trunks. Here you can see the spray and where the trunk had changed colors. Later, he hopped up onto a dead branch to look around for his prey, but he didn't see anything. This pair of male lions had decided to take their siesta right beside the road. You can imagine the traffic jam it caused. Now male lions travel in coalitions of other males and they hold large territories that include several prides of females. I wish we'd gotten a picture of the back of the head of this red crested corhon because its red crest was lying flat along the back of its head. These birds are about the size of our pheasant, only slightly bigger. This is a very big stork called a saddle billed stork and you can see its little yellow saddle on its bill. And we knew this one was a male because it has a black eye and a yellow wattle. Whereas this one is a female because it has no wattle and a yellow eye. The wildebeest, the blue wildebeest, um, also have a bull that collects a whole herd of harem, a harem of females. Now we figured this was a bull in his harem. These are not the white bearded wildebeest that you hear of having that amazing massive migration from the Ngorongoro crater in Tanzania to the Maasai Mara in Kenya each year. They're the blue wildebeest. Now when a male hippo decides he wants to show dominance, he will open his mouth like this and look at my big teeth. He will even do this display when cars get too near or other animals get too near. This is a yellow-billed stork that was digging around in the mud for worms and crustaceans. Love that pink on his back. Aha, a little sign that summer was on its way. This is a colorful African stone chat. It migrates into Kruger from Central Africa. Arrow-marked babblers travel in large groups and they're very noisy, so it's very hard to miss them when they're around. Here's another one of Bill's favorites, the barbets. This is a crested barbet and it, is, it has an extended trill that is a common sound to every safari.
believe it or not, I heard that that trill it can be made when the bird is breathing out and when he is breathing in. And that's why it can last so long. Two of the smallest antelope species are this stenbok, meaning stands like a rock, from their habit of being perfectly still when a predator is nearby. And this gray diker, um, and they're both very, very similar, if you may have noticed that, except for the diker has this cute little mohawk. Both the male and the female has this cute little mohawk. The male, of course, having horns and the female not. Now here is a very large antelope and it was my favorite. It's called a sable antelope and they're very rare. And so Bill and I actually had to research to see where the most likely spots were that we might be able to see a sable antelope. And we were so excited when we saw this big, beautiful male. Then about a kilometer down the road, we came across this herd. Now you will notice that the females and the immature are brown, whereas the males are black. As we were watching these guys, that first male from up the road a ways showed up about 100 yards away. Well, this dominant male from this group did not like that one little bit and he took off chasing him and the other male turned around and beat a quick retreat. Hyenas are very strange animals whose whoop can often be heard throughout the night as they roam around searching for cheetah and leopard kills to steal. They do hunt on their own occasionally when a carcass can't be found. Their cubs are really cute during the first few months, looking more like a little black bear. We found a hyena den underneath a culvert below the road. It had cubs of all sizes, this one was about three months old when its spot pattern begins to, begins to show. And hyenas can be identified all their life because they keep a specific spot pattern. This mother was suckling these two little cubs that were about three or four months old. Ah, another sign that summer was coming. The impala lilies had begun to bloom. And then back to the Natan Donyathi hide for another hot afternoon. This common green shank was wading about and there was this giraffe that was eating out here in the distance. And we took some pictures of the red-billed quilia in the branches of the tree. Now the red-billed quilias out on the savanna grasslands are the ones that collect in those huge black clouds of birds that lift and rise. And then after we had been there about an hour, we discovered that there was this six foot long rock python that had been there in the tree the whole time and we had not even noticed it. He was being so still. The three banded plover looks very much like our kill deer except for his red eye and red bill. The male and the female work together raising their chicks. And if you look closely, you'll see that this little chick was being a bit shy and kept trying to hide under mommy's wing. But like I said, the red-billed quilias come in great huge flocks and we were a little disappointed because they did not have their summer plumage. Also flying around the, the water holes were these beautiful red-breasted um, swallows. And if you look down here, you can see how similar they are to the American barn swallow. Now these are interesting birds. They look like they're fairly big, but they really aren't. These are speckled mouse birds and red-faced mouse birds. And from the top of their crest to the bottom of their tail, they're only about 12 inches long. They travel in groups and they're fruit eaters. So they um, are often found, as you can see here, in little fruit trees. Sometimes the vervet monkeys would come down for a drink and the baboons. And we often found these water monitors five or six feet in length swimming at the hides. An African jacana is walking across the lily pads. Their huge toes disperse their weight so well that the lily pad barely even moves. 
and the black crakes would come right out in the open and walk around as long as you sat quietly in the hide. Sadly, especially at the Skakuza hide, there were groups that would come in talking out loud and uh, it was very frustrating when they scared the birds away. Now, Skakuza, or the Lake Panic Hide that we were just at, is very close to the Skakuza camp, which is the largest camp and near the famous Paul Kruger Gate. Skakuza has a big store, a fancy restaurant, a cafe, and great Wi-Fi. And underneath this thatched roof here on the store, were these cute little epaulette bats waiting for night. And if you look closely right here, you can see their little epaulets. There were three species of hornbills that were common in Kruger National Park. This one is the African gray hornbill. This is the red-billed hornbill, also known as Zazu on the Lion King. And this is the flying banana or the yellow-billed hornbill. This dark chanting goshawk had killed a birch-felled gerbil, and you can see he came up to this sturdy branch to eat it. We were very excited when we found these not so common ground hornbills. They were rather far back in the bush, but we were so excited to see them that we snapped all kinds of pictures of them. And then we drove about 75 feet forward and voila, there's one right beside the road. This one is a female and you can tell because of this opening here that shows darker, it actually will show blue in the light. Um, I loved listening to their deep, deep hooting sound that they made, which is kind of a boop, 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 boop. boop. Now, if you're lucky enough at the time of year that we were there to come across a flowering tree, you were sure to see some of Africa's nectar suckers. They don't have hummingbirds. Instead, they have sunbirds. But as you can see by looking at this lovely collared sunbird, they are just as spectacular as our hummingbird. This, is, this beauty is a Mariko sunbird with its wide band of purple maroon. This one is a white-bellied sunbird. And probably my favorite is this scarlet-breasted sunbird. There are several species of canaries in South Africa, but the most common one is this yellow-fronted canary. The kingfishers in Africa are amazing. From this tiny little malachite kingfisher with its bright orange bill and iridescent blue back. The striped kingfisher is slightly larger and, and it's not quite as pretty as the malachite and it is actually an insectivore. The pied kingfishers do hunt sometimes from a perch, but more often you would see them hovering over the water hunting for their prey. The giant kingfisher, as its name suggests, is the largest kingfisher in South Africa. Almost, but not quite as big as a kookaburra. But it is two inches larger than our ringed kingfisher. This guy is called a hammer cop, which means hammerhead, which seems like a perfect description of what he is. And he's part of the wading bird family. Now this beautiful male leopard was having his afternoon siesta about 10 feet from the driver's side of the road. When some, pardon me for saying this, some idiot teenager decided to climb out the passenger side window of her truck and lean over the cab for a picture. The snooze ended immediately and for a few seconds, we were afraid we were going to have a scary video called what not to do in Kruger National Park. I love these lesser striped swallows. They were so striking with their striped chests and their rusty head and their blue backs. The morning chorus almost always included the lovely song of this pretty white-throated robin chat. 
Now this big Ellie knew he owned the road and nobody was going to question him. So for about a kilometer, we very slowly followed him from way behind while all the cars that were in front of him slowly backed up to give him room. Lots of little birds would come to drink in the heat of the day, like these red-billed fire finches. And you'll see this is the female and here's the male. And also like this common wax bill. Now, if the fire finches and wax bills hadn't come down, we would not even have noticed these thick water thick knees that used to be called dickops. They were very camouflage. They're mostly nocturnal and we would frequently hear them calling in the night. There are not as many ostriches in South Africa as we saw in the Serengeti, but we did see this one female ostrich and this one male ostrich, but they weren't together. This is a ground scraper thrush and it is about the size of our American robin. And like most thrushes, it has a very melodious song. Now hippos are very dangerous, especially if they're out of the water. They can run 35 kilometers an hour and they really freak out if somebody gets between them and the water. There are more Africans killed each year by hippos than any of the other big five. The Cory Bustard, at 55 inches tall and 39 pounds, is the largest flying bird in the world. Like a giant grouse, it will fluff up its neck feathers and its tail feathers and strut its stuff to the females during mating season. South Africa has seven species of bee eaters, insectivores with long down curved bills. They hawk insects from a perch and then they beat the stingers off on the branch before swallowing them. This one is a migrant and it is called a European bee eater. This is a swallow-tailed bee eater, a white-fronted bee eater, and this little bee eater. We missed out on the other three by not being there during the summer. This tawny eagle had just taken a bath and was drying its feathers. Now, here is that huge Marshall Eagle I was talking about. It is 33 inches tall, which is two inches taller than our bald eagle, but it is 30 ounces heavier than our bald eagle. And it had caught this five foot long monitor lizard. Take a look at those powerful talons it has. Now, the monitor lizard was actually still alive when we came across this kill, and it was trying to whip the, uh, the eagle off of itself by swinging its tail. We watched it for about 25 minutes. It was totally awesome. Not far from the Marshall Eagle kill, we came across this Feroz Eagle Owl. Not only is it awesome because of how huge it is, but take a look at those pink eyelids. Isn't that amazing? Every time a car went by, it would open its eyes and then go back to sleep. Mocking cliff chats were found only in the kopis or the large rock formations. And we found this female and this male cliff chat among the kopis or at in the central of South, excuse me, in the central part of Kruger. African fish eagles are monogamous and they mate for life. Plus, they hunt together, and one pair will one of the pair will flush out their intended prey, which is usually a bird, and then it will distract that prey while the other one comes in from behind to make a kill. Did I not say African? Said fish eagle. Oh, I'm sorry. I said fish eagle. This is an African hawk eagle. Thank you for telling me that, Bill. Um. Most of the places that we would park, the ponds that we would come by, we would see these African spoonbills. 
Now, one time Bill and I stopped at a canal filled with water hyacinths to take a look at the map. When we suddenly watched the water hyacinths start swaying back and forth, and up came these young hippos from under the water hyacinth. And if you look carefully right here, you'll see that there's a fourth about to make an appearance. Helmet shrikes are shrikes with these strange puffy bare skin patches around their eyes. This white crowned one had a yellow eye patch and the dark brown Retz's helmet shrike had red eye patches. These birds were always found in groups, kind of like bush tits, and they were pretty noisy so you mostly knew when they were around. Here is a white crowned shrike for comparison, no eye ring. These tiny little budding quail have lovely rusty chests, but their backs are very mottled, which makes for an awesome camouflage. Plus they're only five and a half inches long, and we would have missed this one if it hadn't run across the road in front of us. This is one of a pair of double banded sand grouse that we saw on the road. This is the male and the female had a was all modeled like the back of the male. Now there's a very interesting thing about sand grouse. It's their method of carrying water back to their newly hatched chicks. The male, and this is not my picture, the male walks into the water, fluffs up its chest feathers, and tra traps droplets of water in them. Then, carrying about two tablespoons of water, it flies back to its chicks and they get the water off of the feathers. Sometimes these birds can fly as much as 20 miles to carry water to their chicks. There are two different species of the diurnal owlets in Kruger National Park. This one is the barred owlet, and it is very similar to the pearl spotted owlet. And the best way to be able to tell them apart is to wait for them to turn their head because the pearl spotted has fake eyes on the back of its head. Okay, back to that Tambuti tented camp. Well, we wanted to spend a night here because we had heard that the honey badgers would come into camp at night. So we came to in, got settled into our tent, and as the sun set, we took a walk around the camp. Of course, the gates were locked by that time and everything was closed up. But walk as we would, we did not see a honey badger. Later in the night, we heard this huge ruckus coming from the tent next door. And the next morning, the people who stayed there for the night told us that a honey badger had come onto their porch, opened up all of the cupboards, dumped out all the dishes and the pots and pans hunting for food. We were a little happy that we didn't see that honey badger. Another treat in the Kruger National Park are, park are the wild dogs or painted dogs. They're endangered due to the fact that they need a large territory to roam and the fact that they easily contract rabies from other domestic dogs and mammals. They had just made a kill and these puppies were happily playing with full tummies. Then the dominant male spotted a hyena and took off after it to chase it away. When he returned to the pack, he ran right past my open window. In fact, I have a picture of him that he is so close to me, I can only get part of his back. Not too many kilometers from the wild dog sighting, oops, we saw these, um, the two little cheetah cubs and their mother. And the cheetah cubs were so young that they were still all fluffy and cute. But it was the heat of the day and so they just lay there and after about a half an hour, we decided to move on. These are tiny little chickadee-like birds called chin spot batis. You can see their cute little chin spot and the rusty uh, chest band. I thought this female was much prettier than her male because he didn't have a chin spot and he only had black on his chest. We saw a lot of Nile crocodiles, but mostly they were lying beside the ponds or lakes 
because the rivers due to the um the drought were very very low and so we did not see them by the rivers the next day which was our next to last day of our trip it rained and this little leopard tortoise came out onto the road to drink from the puddles of where the rain had fallen. Fervent monkeys are very cute, but they're also extremely uh, problematic in the picnic areas where they come in to scavenge from the garbage. In fact, we saw one run up, grab a lady sandwich and take off running with it. They actually had got guards that guarded the picnic areas with slingshots and a pile of stones. And if the fervent monkeys got too pesty, well, they got a little sting on the bum. There are several species of parrots in South Africa, but only one in the Kruger National Park. And this one is the brown headed. I just had to show you this female giraffe with her fluffy Aussie cones. She was so cute. This baby giraffe was so young that it still had its umbilical cord attached. These are clip springers and they're found only in the kopis or large rocky hills. And like mountain goats, they're very sure footed. I zoomed in here so you could see that the male has these spiky little horns and the female does not have any horns at all. This is a magpie shrike and they were fairly common and they are quite magpie-like. Only their heads and beaks are shrike-like and like other shrikes, they will catch other birds and they will also raid bird nests to get the chicks. Another bird that has a long tail and a long bill was a scimitar bill. And this is its bill right here. That long curved bill that it uses to pluck off the bark and get to the insects underneath. Here is another view and you can see that long bill. And also you can see that in the sunlight it was iridescent purple. Okay. I'll tell you truthfully, I am almost done, so be patient with me. But I have to tell you this story because it was so totally amazing. We had stopped the, the, the Nezamani Dam. They called it, we would call it a reservoir. And we had been there several times before, but this particular day, there was this pride of lions lying there in the shade in the heat. Suddenly their heads came up and they looked off toward the water hole as a herd of Cape Buffalo approached, which happens to be their favorite food. It wasn't long before they were all up, all 22 of them and stalking the Buffalo. But a Buffalo bull decided he wasn't going to let them threaten the calves and a chase began. Not the lions chasing the Buffalo, but the Buffalo chasing the lions. Well, at first the bull chased those lions for about 20 yards or so. Then he turned around and immediately those lions turned back and one jumped up on his back trying to make a kill. But the bull's three buddies came to his rescue and those three bulls chased that lion pride for about 200 yards up an embankment and across, across the road behind us. Now, all this was taking place over about a period of an hour and a huge traffic jam formed, as you can imagine. And the park rangers eventually had to come to direct the traffic to get it going again. And then it was our last day. We were second in line at the gate to get out that morning because we didn't want to waste a single minute of time. And this little golden-tailed woodpecker was one of our rewards. Our second reward is in this tree. Anybody see it? It was this gorgeous male leopard with not one, but two kills up in the tree with him. He had a gigantuously full tummy and he was just laying there letting the food digest until he could eat some more. And if you look carefully, you can see here is one of his kills here in the back. 
And he was so lazy that part of the time we watched him, he was just laying there with his head on that first kill that's up here. We had only had a fleeting glimpse of a rhino in the first 14 days. So we were thrilled to come around a corner and see this big guy right in the road. We turned off our engine and watched him and soon more and more cars began to stop. And then some idiot decided he was a little bit impatient to get going. He gunned his engine and went flying past him. Well, it's a good thing that guy was going fast because this big guy was on his feet immediately and heading towards that car. And that's when we realized that his smaller mate had been there beside him the whole time and we hadn't even noticed. A quick bathroom stop gave us three of these green wood hoopoo. They were foraging in the straw of the bathroom's roof and you can see the long probing bill that they have too. It was a wonderful surprise when we came upon a male lion as we headed back for our rest camp that last night. He was lounging beside the road and yawning and rolling back and forth and stretching and we had a wonderful time watching him as the sun dropped in the sky. And then as just as we were saying, oh, we've got to get back to camp now, another male lion came up from down over the embankment and joined him. They rubbed heads and had a lovely bonding greeting. And then they plopped down together and we so wanted to stay, but we were already going to have to drive at the top of the speed limit to get back to camp before we got locked out. So we had to drag ourselves away. And then it was the last morning, but there was still one more little special surprise for us. This is a female paradise flycatcher, and she is beautiful with her crested head and her blue eye ring and her rusty tail and wings. But the male is even more spectacular because he has this really, really long tail and he is so beautiful. But as most flycatchers, they were bouncing around among the foliage and it was very hard to get some good pictures of them. And then it was goodbye Kruger National Park and our wonderful trip that we had. So we said goodbye and we had gotten 226 different species of birds. And um, we had a fantastic trip. We would recommend it to anyone and we just want anybody out there to know that if anybody in the future would maybe want to take a self-drive to Kruger National Park, that we would be more than happy to give them any kind of hints that they might have or have any questions answered about what it's like to, to drive a self-drive in Kruger National Park. Now, our 15-day self-drive costs the same as a three-day safari with a safari company did. And if you go with a safari company, they only take you out for three hours in the morning and three hours in the afternoon, and they do not go to bird hides in the middle of the day like we got to do it. So like I said, if anyone has any questions, we would be happy to answer them. And back to you, Larry. Uh, that was incredible. Um, I actually uh, put a bunch of questions in the chat as we were going along, because I know I wouldn't remember them by the time you, we were done. Um, uh, and one of them was answered already. The, the the first shot you had of the two hippos in the in the water, I I didn't know if they had crocodiles or alligators there, but they're they are alligators, correct? No, they're Nile crocodiles. Oh, crocodiles, crocodiles. Okay. Nile crocodiles. And then um, I wondered how high the temperatures were there in the day during the daytime. Okay, keep keep in mind that we were there in the winter. So basically it got kind of chilly at night, but during the heat of the day, it was like 85, 88 degrees. So the heat of the day was nice and warm. So if you were in the sun sunshine in the heat of the day, you felt pretty warm. But in the summer, now it can get up to 100, 105, 110 in the heat of the day. So obviously you want to do a bird trip there in the winter. 
Well, for two reasons. Now, here's the bad news. It's, if you go in the summer, you get to see all the summer migrants. And some are spectacular, like a woodland kingfisher, which is just all iridescent blue, and it's beautiful. But the two bad things is, is it rains often in the summer, so you get wet, and there's tons of foliage on the trees, so you don't get to see things very much. And mosquitoes are everywhere. We oh. do not even have to worry about mosquitoes. Yeah, that would be a big negative for me. Um, uh, let's see, what else did I put on? Oh, why do the elephants uh, get those cavities on their heads as they get older? Is that, are their heads soft, or is that actually bone that? There's bone there, and, and one of the reasons why that happens is they actually have six sets of teeth that they go through in their lifetime. And as they wear one set of teeth down, a new set will move in. But then when they get older and they get to their last set of teeth, they don't get any more, which means that they can't eat the food as well and they can't digest the food as well. So they start getting like skinny and they start sinking in and you can tell they're older. And it has to do with their teeth. And then very sadly, they eventually starve to death because they can't eat. I'm um, on my last set of teeth. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see, uh, one of the first questions I asked was about the falls. I was wondering how wide it was and Catherine um, wrote down here that it was 5,600 feet wide. Oh, the, the, they're 5,623, I think it is wide, and 355 feet tall. I have that on my first page. Yes, so no that's idea. almost a mile wide. They're yeah. very wide, and you have a nice long walk as you walk along the face of that falls. Does, it, does anybody else have any questions? That was, uh, that was a fabulous uh, narration and um, incredible that you guys got those photographs of all those birds. You know, I wish we could have done this, Larry, because the truth is, is that I had the still camera and Bill had a movie camera, but because of Zoom, we couldn't oh. get movie to work right. We oh, have to get the fantastic video. I was, I was wondering, because I, I figured you must have some videos of, uh, especially of the wildlife, of the animals. We, we did, but, but with Zoom, you're, it, there just kept being these jumpy slow. pauses yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Right. Well, I'll have to, uh, I, I want to have a, a, a personal one-on-one -on -one then uh, video uh, show. You've got it, buddy. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions? Dan, you're muted. You're muted, Dan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, now I'm here. Maybe there will be another time for uh, for that video show with the chapter another day. Another day, but you know the the still photos is just so incredible. I mean, we know it's out there, but just to see the tremendous crazy variety of elaborate colors and forms and and hear of their lifestyles and and that's just really neat and thank you for sharing that it's it's just really neat um and, and as so, you can imagine we um, had a wonderful time I guess. Well, you know, I'll tell people uh, before before we all came on here. Uh, Bill said that that drive through Kruger was the best of all the. I think you're saying of all the birding that that uh, they've done, which is extensive. As I said, three in both hemispheres, and uh, boy, it it sure looked like it. That that was really neat. Yeah, uh, fabulous, um, uh, fabulous narration right. also. Great presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And and listen, you're going to be a tough act to follow, but uh, folks, stay tuned, and and we'll let you know what's going to be coming up uh, next month on our second Saturday of 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 2021. Um, so uh, uh, you know. Thank you all uh, and have a great uh, few weeks here. Uh, uh, have, happy Christmas and New Year's and, and, uh, and then we will see you again. Thanks.